Hey everybody, I hope you're doing well today. Now let's take a look at the arguments for protectionism. In other words, why governments protect their economies. Why would the government get involved in the free market, in free trade between two different countries, especially when they know that in the long run it is best for the entire world to have free trade and a free flow of of economic goods and services and resources from each country so that the most efficient allocation of resources can happen. Why would governments move to protect their own economies? So let's take a look. So the arguments for protectionism really rest on the answers, it should say, to two particular questions. Why is it that countries do not trade freely if it is good for all countries involved? And also, why is it that countries often protect their economies from imports? So these are the two questions that you must answer in order to make a, a strong argument for protectionism. All right, well, here are the arguments for it. Number one, okay, and we're going to look at these more specifically in a second. And you'll see that they're not really that valid. But these are the arguments given for protectionism. Number one, protecting domestic employment. Two, protecting the economy from low-cost labor. Three, protecting an infant or sunrise industry. Four, avoiding the risks of over-specialization. Five, strategic reasons. Six, to prevent dumping. Seven, to protect product standards. Eight, to raise government revenue. And lastly, to correct a balance of payments deficit. So those are the nine reasons often given by countries. Um, for protectionism, as offered up by Jocelyn Blink in her very, very well done course companion. So let's take a look at them in a more in-depth manner. Okay, so the first one, protecting domestic employment. Okay, at any given time and economy, there will be some industries. So here's the setup. There'll be some industries that are in decline because they cannot compete with foreign competition. And that's where this notion of sunset industries, you know, when the sun sets, the day is over. And so these are industries that the sun is setting on, that their, their, their prime is passing. And I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and it's a, it's a steel town. And when I was growing up in the, in the mid-80s, you know, that was the sunset time for the steel business in the United States. It's not that the United States wasn't good at it. It's just that they weren't competitive anymore. But the U.S. government throughout the 60s and 70s did a lot to try to protect these sunset industries to um, protect domestic employment. Okay? But you got to look at it this way. In some ways... Um, protecting domestic um, employment really isn't very strong because it's likely that the industry will continue to decline no matter what and that simply the protection of this particular industry is just prolonging it, which is the case of the steel business in the United States. Eventually in the 80s, they, they removed the protective tariffs and Japanese steel flooded the U.S. market and the U.S. steel mills went, went bankrupt because they couldn't compete. Um, so although maybe in the short run they're avoiding social costs, in the 60s and 70s I guess they, they avoided that, but in the long run it would be better to, to re-employ those resources somewhere else in the economy. And so it really led to long-term pain, you could argue, um, by protecting those particular industries by, by putting up a tariff. Okay, so protecting domestic employment. Secondly, protecting the economy from low-cost labor. So it's often argued that the main reason for declining domestic industries is the low cost of labor in exporting countries and that the economy should be protected from imports that are produced in countries where the cost of labor is very low. So the idea here, and this is a very popular political position to take, to protect U.S. jobs, to protect jobs so that they um, can get elected. Okay, well, that might be a valid political <laughs> argument and it certainly would appeal to any sort of manufacturing uh, worker because oftentimes in developed nations, the manufacturing aspect or the manufacturing sector of the particular society is really at risk. And the reason for that is that as a, comp as a country develops, the manufacturing base tends to be less competitive because wages have gotten so high. And so it, th what happens is developing nations can provide the same kind of labor for what much lower wage rates. And as a result, firms take their business elsewhere 
and, and to China, to Mexico, in the case of the United States, and they make their, their same products there. I mean, Air Jordan Nike shoes used to be made in the United States. Now they're made in China. Why? Because they can get the same quality Air Jordans from Chinese workers than you can from U.S. workers, and yet you pay the Chinese workers a tenth of the price. There's a case of a town in, in Indiana, in the central part of the United States, where the whole town was based on, on, on the production of socks for Hanes. And they, Hanes, after the North American Free Trade Agreement, literally picked up their factory and moved it to Mexico because now there's free trade with Mexico and they made their socks in Mexico. And that entire economy, that entire town collapsed because what, they were, what their economy was based on, of course, was on making socks. So you can see that there's a lot of political costs here. In terms of protecting low-cost labor, sure, that's a really popular position. But the thing is, and here's the judgment or valuation part of it, this really goes against the whole concept of comparative advantage. And if you understand comparative advantage, you, mean, you realize that it would mean that domestic consumers would pay higher prices than they should um, and that the production in the protected economy would take place at an inefficient level, right? It eliminates the whole comparative advantage. The comparative advantage simply says, hey, if you have a comparative advantage in, in making socks, in the case of, of, of Mexico, then they should be the ones that make it, okay? So supply-side policies that focus on labor markets emphasize the importance of making labor flexible enough to adapt to changing economic circumstances, Right? And therefore, this puts the, the, the responsibility on the governments to, to continue to educate their populace in, the, in, the, in, in case, for example, if all of the manufacturing jobs in a particular town go away, that those people are trained enough to be able to morph into some sort of other productive worker. So protecting low-cost labor, while a valid political argument may be and we might get you elected, really isn't, doesn't stand up to a very good argument economically. All right. Part number three, protecting an infant or sunrise industry. Many governments argue that an industry that is just developing may not have the economies of scale advantages that larger industries in other countries may enjoy. And this, again, kind of leads up to the, f to the fact that it doesn't, it's not really true. And it's an excuse what, what it means of protecting a sunrise industry, so if there's a, a fledgling industry, an industry that's just taking off, and you're trying to compete against international uh, firms, that um, the government should protect that industry so that it can have a chance to, to, to build up. Think of it as like a, a sunrise industry, right? The sun is just coming up and rising up in that industry. It's a new industry. It's an emerging industry. Think of it as a child, you know? And so the government's a parent, right? And they've got to protect this little child so that they can grow. And then when they become an adult, well, then they can fight for themselves. But until they're an adult, you know, you got to protect them. Okay, but if you think about it, the argument against this, so now the judgment or evaluation portion of it, really what makes something or an economy, I'm sorry, makes an industry have potential success is the availability of capital, the capital markets that are available to it. And in many developed nations, there's really no basis for this argument because because take like the technology industry, for example, I mean, there's an enormous amount of investment put into um, really small firms who really don't have that much chance of making it, but, they're, but they actually do have the ability to compete against the bigger firms as a result of having access to this, uh, this, these, these financial markets. Okay? It is likely, however, that in developing countries without access to this money, that an infant industry argument to justify protectionist policies is legitimate, right? But the problem is that if you're an industrializing nation or a developing nation and you do that, then you're going to run up against some major political costs coming from the more powerful nations who probably won't like the fact that you're trying to do that. Okay, another argument given for protectionism is to avoid... The risk of over-specialization, and the argument here goes the governments may want to limit over-specialization if it means that the country could become over-dependent on the export sales of one or two products. In other words, any change in the world market for these products might have serious consequences for the country's economy. And I like this example. It's a little bit flawed, but it's just a really easy example. You think about Saudi Arabia. Of course, they got more oil than anyone else on the planet, and of course, they're over-specialized in the production of oil. But if you think about it, or if you've been there, which I haven't, but may, some of you may live there, um, or have been there, um, 
they, they don't really have an underbelly of, of, of development, of industrialization. And so there is an argument for protectionism that might say like, hey, okay, so they need to, to protect their economy f because that might be a problem in the future, this over-specialization. And this argument, however, doesn't really stand up to any sort of economic uh, challenge to it because really over-specialization doesn't really a kind of... of, of protectionism, right? It's just another way, it's just an excuse, actually, of talking about the problem that this country has in particular. So, obviously, it's not, it's an internal Saudi Arabia problem if they're over-specialized in something. Um, it's not an external problem. So they can fix it on the internal ways, and therefore it's not an argument for protectionism, because protectionism is protecting yourself from the outside. Okay, next point, strategic reasons. It is often, it is sometimes argued anyway, that certain industries need to be protected in the case that they are needed at times of war or for agriculture, steel, electricity, uh, that certain industries need to be protected so that the country has these resources available in the time of crisis, right? And to some extent, you could say maybe that this is a valid one, but I, I think most economists would say that it's overused. Um, in many cases, it's likely the countries um, that go to war will still have access to many to, to many resources, and just think about World War II, you know, England went to war with uh, England and France, and of course went to war with Germany, and they risked, of course, not having the resources they needed, but they got them, and they mainly got them from the United States, who provided them with all of this, this war material. So oftentimes it still is possible to have the access to the goods that you claim that you need to protect as a result of strategic reasons. Therefore, it doesn't really stand up to being that great of an argument. Next one is to prevent dumping. Obviously, first of all, you have to know what dumping means. Dumping in an economic sense means or is the selling by a country, one country, of a large quantity of a commodity at a lower price than, is, than its production costs in another country. So, for example, the European Union may have a surplus of butter and sell this at a very low cost to a small developing country. Another example of dump dumping is, you know, the United States provides massive subsidies um, to the wheat and corn market in the United States, and it's argued that then they can take that wheat and dump it or sell it at a below market rate because the government's not necessarily interested in making any money in, an, in, a, in a developing nation and ruin the domestic farming there. So the developing nation would then um, want to put up a protective... Uh, some sort of form of protectionism in order to prevent this dumping. But the thing that's difficult about this is it's really, really hard, so the argument or the judgment or the evaluation of this argument, is that it's really hard to, to prove this. You know? And also, if a government is subsidizing a domestic industry, it may actually sort of su be supporting the particular dumping. Um, and so an example of this is like developing countries argue that the EU exports subsidize sugar. This is Jocelyn Blink's example. And it's actually, it is actually the case of, it is actually a case of dumping because the price doesn't reflect the actual cost of the EU sugar. So if dumping occurs, if it does occur, it is more likely that there will be a need for talks between governments rather than any form of protectionism, right? And the problem with any sort of protectionism is that they invite some sort of retaliatory uh, measure by the other country. And of course, developing countries are the ones that get dumped on, but they don't have the political, the political strength or the political clout to stand up to the bigger nations. And so if they try, then the bigger nation can just cut off whatever sort of uh, exports or that this particular developing country is exporting, and that developing nation is in big trouble. Okay, so there's the, 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 arguments, uh, the argument of to prevent dumping and the judgment of it or the evaluation of it. Okay, three more to go. So another argument for protectionism is um, to protect product standards. And a country might wish to impose safety, health, or environmental standards on goods being imported into its domestic market in order to ensure that the imports match the standards of domestic products. An example given by Jocelyn Blink is the European Union banned the import of meat in the 1990s because it was treated with hormones. Um, another example more recently was the United States banned a particular kind of toys coming out of China because they had lead paint uh, in them and children are becoming sick as a result of it. And in some, in some cases, this might be a valid argument, of course, because governments have the ability uh, 
um, or should have the ability to protect their own their own people, and it also promotes higher product standards on a global level, right? Um, so maybe of all of these, to protect product standards, this is the most um, reasonable thing, a reasonable argument from a really firm economic standpoint to put up a protectionist barrier against a particular country. Because if you think about it, on the whole, nobody really wants, no one in the world really wants low-quality beef or low-quality toys that could danger their children. So of all of them, I think the product standards one could be the, the, the most valid reason for uh, putting up a protectionist barrier against imports from a different country. Okay, another reason our, our argument for protectionism is to raise government revenue. And this is really straight up simple, right? In many developing countries, it's difficult to collect taxes. And so governments impose import taxes on tariffs on products in order to raise revenue. I lived in Nicaragua for four years, and anything imported in that country was really expensive. And, but the thing was, because it's an agrarian society and most farmers receive their money in cash and in small ways, and there's no like, systematic way of payment, and there's no way of tracking the real amount of income that people make, um, there's this really difficult task for the Nicaraguan government to actually collect income taxes. So in order to get money, what do they do? Well, they, you know, they, they tax imports, which of course is, put, is, is called a tariff. And if you think about it, um, tariffs are politically pretty easy to argue because the countryside doesn't necessarily even know that the tariff is in place. And even though they might be paying higher prices for a particular good, um, they don't they're not necessarily aware of it, and therefore, politically, it's not really a problem for the government. Plus, uh, d developing nations' governments tend to put in high import taxes on things that, say, agrarian workers or farmers or the poor segment of their society, which tends to be, in developing nations, you know, 60 to 70 percent of their populace, they don't import, they don't put tariffs on things that those people would buy. They put imports on things like cars, and electronics and high-priced items uh, to try to import a car into Nicaragua, it almost doubles the price of the car. So, but most people, 95% of the people, are never going to buy a Toyota car, so they don't care. Um, so therefore, the government can raise revenue through um, this protective tariff, right, in order to raise revenue. Okay, and lastly, another reason that, or argument given for protectionism is to governments sometimes, sometimes impose uh, protectionist measures to attempt to reduce import expenditure and thus improve a current account deficit whereby the country is spending more on imports, on its imports of goods and services, than it is earning for its exports of goods and services. And if you have not gotten through, which you haven't, um, the balance of payment sections of the international economics curriculum, this one might not seem to make that much sense. But think about it this way. If you think about aggregate demand, remember aggregate demand is C plus I plus G plus X minus M. And if imports are larger, in other words, your government, your people are spending more money buying things from other countries than um, people are buying from your country, then you might want to tax imports so that it's more difficult for people to buy things from other countries, and then that way, they'll spend their money in your own country, and that will improve your economy. Um, so to correct a balance of payments deficit, what that's basically saying is that your own country is spending more money on buying other countries' stuff than other countries are spending on your stuff. And therefore, governments, and governments want to have a balanced... Um, a balance of payments, it's called. They want to have a balanced checkbook. If you've ever balanced a checkbook, of course, checkbooks don't really exist anymore, but if you want to have a balanced checkbook, that means that you never want to have your people spending more money on imports than other people are spending on, on buying your stuff, on exports. And so a tariff would, would raise the price of imported goods, which would force your consumers to buy more things domestically. Okay? That doesn't necessarily add up very long and doesn't really, so the argument or evaluation of that would simply be that this only works in the short run, right? And it doesn't really address the actual problem because it doesn't actually address or the actual causes of the deficit. So 
if you put up a tariff against something to, 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 to decrease imports, um, you're not really solving the problem. Probably you should work on making your own export business more attractive so that your goods are sought after by other countries. You're not solving the problem. You're kind of hiding it. And plus, anytime you put up a tariff, I'm telling you, there's going to be retaliatory movement by the other country because free trade, um, everybody knows free trade is better for everybody. Um, it's just that real lives and politics get in the way. All right, my friends, there you go, um, the nine arguments for protectionism. And I hope you found this video to be helpful. We'll talk to you in a bit.